The Lord will allow us a hiding place, but not for us to stay there, but rather for us to be strengthened. Now, let me tell you what happened earlier today. People have different hiding places. I'm sorry, not earlier today, earlier this week. I was called to do uh, in-school suspension at, uh, at my wife's school, and I sat in there, and usually I have six, seven, eighth graders, you know, sometimes a fourth grader, third grader. I had four kindergarten boys. Now, it's not so bad when they bring me one, and they're like, this one stabbed another kid with a pencil. We don't want to kick him out of school. We're going to send him to end school. Okay. Sat him in his desk. He looked at me, little black boy. He looked at me. I said, now here's the deal. I said, you're going to work all day, okay? I said, this is what you got to do because you made a bad decision, okay? I said, but if you're good today, you do all your work, you don't have to come back and see me, okay? So what you got to do, he placed his desk in front of mine, facing the other way. I said, I am not your business. The only thing that's your business is your pencil and your paper and you write. I said, you got all these papers to do, just go ahead and start. If you need anything, though, if you need to use the bathroom, need some water, whatever you need, need some help, Raise your hand. Don't raise your hand and turn around. Don't just holler out. I said, just raise your hand. Well, while I was giving him instruction, one of the aides brought three other kindergartners from the same class into the room. And she had this look. Mr. White, these boys, these boys right here, every day they're doing this and they're doing this and they're doing this. And this. So it's all right. We'll take care of it. Do you have enough work? She brought a stack of papers like this big. She said, oh, we have enough work. She handed it to me. I said, okay, I'll take care of it. It's a little bit hot there. Just step on out. So I explained the same thing to all of them. I go to sit down at my desk. And that first little boy, he's got his head now. He should be facing this way. He's got his head like this. And he's looking at me out of the corner of his eye. And I said, I can see you. He went, I can still see you. I'm not your business. You got to do your work, okay? He went, This was his hiding place. Did you see that? His two hands were his hiding place. Now, everything in me wanted to go, It's okay. But I kind of did. <laughs> there you go, <gotta> go. <laughs> I kind of did. I went over to him and I put my arm around. I said, "Listen, don't cry." I want my mommy. I said, "I want mine too," but it's just not going to happen today. Okay, <laughs> it's going to be all right. I said, "It's going to be all right." And I had to go over it again, explain it to him. Now, these little boys' hiding place because I had another incident just like that a few moments later. Their hiding place was right here, right here. That's where they had to go to get some kind of peace. That turmoil of having to sit in a desk and do work. And believe me, it's terrible enough for a boy to have to sit in a class. Boys like to go. They like to be active. They like to go, go, go. And then you want me to sit at a desk and sit here and look. There's nobody in front of them. It's just them and paper. And then put a kindergarten. Oh, man. I would never put a kindergartner in there, by the way. But that's just a personal opinion. We all have our own hiding places. When stuff happens, happens to us, what do we do? Each one of us does something different. My thing, when I get to the point where I've just got to escape, it doesn't matter where I go as long as I go. It, it doesn't matter. I, Stelina has watched me before when I've been on the phone. I don't hold still on a phone. I'm going around, doing something, drawing something over here on the table, something like that. It's almost the same thing when I am frustrated. A lot of times I'll get in the car and just drive. Don't have to have a destination. Just go. Just go. Just go. It helps me think. It helps me calm down. Some people, they go to their bed. Anybody goes to their bedroom or go to their bed? Mm -hmm. How many of you uh, go to the closet? Mm -hmm. How many of us go to the refrigerator? Okay. <laughs> We're together. Okay. That's all you see. <laughs> we all have our hiding places. Let me tell you what's going on here. Ahab didn't wait around except to see Elijah uh, cash in on the deal. Elijah's cash in. He said, look, God is our God, and we're going to do away with all these false prophets, and he does away with them. Elijah saw just, I'm sorry, Ahab saw just enough to go slinking back, get on his chariot, and ride straight back to the castle. He didn't wait a day. He didn't wait for five hours. You can see, you know when a kid's telling on their brother or sister? You know that look in their face? 
No! And they don't care who you're calling through or what you're doing. You're on the phone. No, 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 I got to tell. That's exactly how Ahab was. He had to tell mama. So he went running back to mama, and here's what he said. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. And Elijah did this. And Elijah did that. And Elijah did this. And with all, how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah. Let me ask you a question. Was Jezebel the queen? That's a yes. Was Jezebel the queen? Yeah. All right, you passed that test. <laughs> Jezebel was the queen. She could send an army after Elijah. She knew where Elijah was. She could have sent five guys with clubs in their hands to Elijah. She could have went herself with two soldiers, captured him, and ran through. But what she choose to do? She sent a messenger. Does this not remind you of Satan? That as soon as you do the right thing, he attacks. And most of the time, he attacks with threats and words. Sometimes it's from family, sometimes it's from friends, sometimes it's from enemies, sometimes it's people at work. It doesn't matter. This is what Satan does. He will attack you right after a victory. Right after it, she goes and sends a messenger, and the messenger comes running up to him and says, Here are the words of the queen. And about tomorrow, at this time, you'll be dead. You've got 24 hours to live. Why did you just kill him then? Because Satan is full of threats. And don't you know Ahab probably included, and fire really did come down from heaven. Fire consumed up all the sacrifice, the altar, the stones, licked up all the water that was in the trench. It took it all. That was a hot fire. And it came down from heaven. There was no trickery to it. Don't you know that was played in the back? And so Jezebel knew she probably couldn't do anything to him. So guess what? I'm going to threaten him. How many of us have gone to run? Have ran away because of threats. Mm -hmm. Tucked our tail and hid. We step up for the Lord. We start to witness to somebody. And they're like, well, what about this? Well, I remember when you used to do that. Don't come around here. Again. Don't talk to me about that stuff. And we turn tail. How many of us have done that? I've done that. And I'm ashamed to say it. But let me tell you something. This is how Satan works. If he can kick the legs out from under you before you get going with Christ, he'll do it. You see, Elijah was finally starting to really walk with God in faith. And Satan's scared. When you kneel down at an altar of prayer and you give everything to God and then you stand up and you start witnessing for God, Satan is scared. God just won a great victory. Satan hates that. So what's he going to do? He's going to attack you any way possible. Me and Sister Sheila were talking about this the other night. Satan attacks. He attacks terribly. He would do things to us to absolutely tear us down. Anybody else, it would absolutely crumble and send us away. We'd never come back to church. We'd never lift our hands in praise. But God allows things just to, have things to happen to us like this to show us our level of faith and to grow our level of faith. Why do bad things happen to Christians? Simple. Because they can take it. Because they have God on their side. Let's give them a hand clap of praise, shall we? So here's what happened. And when he saw that, when he was read the decree of the queen, he arose. I would like to stop there and say, and he went straight into that palace. And he told her, I would like to do that in my life. And then when that bill came due, I didn't give up. <laughs> when that prognosis came from the doctor, I just shook my head and said, no, sir, doctor, it ain't going to happen like that. doesn't really happen like that sometimes, does it, church? And we, unfortunately, act exactly, whether spiritually or physically, just like Elijah did. You see, this should be encouraging to you. And I'll show you why. Watch this. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life. You can just imagine him grabbing his man's skirt, tucking it into his belt, getting out of there. Got the staff going. He's out of there. He must stay around to be killed. He had just seen fire fall from heaven. God had been talking to him himself. I, I'm not talking about God sent a messenger. I, I'm not telling you that, that God you know, wrote it in the sky or, or, or left him a stone tablet. God himself was talking to him. He heard God's words in his ears. He heard them acting on what God said and fire came down from heaven. And now somebody sent
sends him a message and he's like, I'm gone. Now, we shake our head at that, as do I. But sometimes it takes even less to drive us out of the house of God. Talk to me. Somebody doesn't even have to say anything to us. They just give us a look. Oh, I'm out. I call these parachute Christians. Because as soon as something happens, they bail. I'm out. I'm out. It should be that way. How do we prevent that from happening? We have to continually remind ourselves who we are and who God is. You see, if we know who we are in Christ, we know who we are in the flesh. Nothing. We know who we are in Christ. I can do all things in Christ. And we remember that He will not let one of His words fall. Nothing can run us away. True? All right, you're not going to scare me tonight. Here we go. You might lull me to sleep. I'm just kidding. All right. <laughs> and went for his life and came to Beersheba. Can you say Beersheba? Which belongs to Judah and left his servant there. In other words, he's like, hey, listen, they might not be able to, to track one of us alone. So you stay here. They could probably track two of us. And you kind of slow me down. I got to run. Got out of there. You stay here. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die. Now, I've been down before. I've been, I've been down, but I ain't never requested that I could die because I'm kind of afraid the Lord might let it happen. <laughs> Lord, and can you imagine this? I mean, this is a guy that saw more power of God Physically, than a lot of us would, could, could ever think of us. And now this guy, because of a letter read to him from the queen, has gone about five, probably about 250 miles out of the way. He's sitting in the middle of the desert. And he's like, well, there's a juniper tree. Looks like a good place to curl up and pray. Nope, and die. I'm just going to ask God if I can go ahead and die. Anybody ever feel like dying? I felt like it. I felt like, oh, I just wish I could die. If life's going to be like this, if, if she's going to act like that, if he's going to have that attitude. How many ever said it? Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. That felt good. I'm going to ask that question again. It felt like a breeze came up here. All these hands going up. Amen. Here we go. <laughs> and said, it is enough now, Lord. Listen. He starts to take control over God's will. God had a definite will for Elijah. God's not going to hide his will from Elijah. He said, walk by faith. He said, well, I'll tell you where to go. I have no doubt that Elijah knew that God did not want him to run into the wilderness and hide and ask God for him to die. But now he's looking at God with all the boldness in the world saying, God, it's enough. Who are we to tell God it's enough? Until we have borne the sins of all humanity. Until we have carried an old rugged cross. Until we have been hung between heaven and earth. Until we have had stripes on our back. Until we have had our beards plucked out. Until we have been beaten and spit on and pummeled and put a crown of thorns on our head. Who are we to tell God it is enough? God will tell us when it's enough. Amen? Oh, but too many times we get that way, don't we, church? <laughs> God knows. God knows how much you can take. And it may seem like he's pushed you to the limit. And then he's just nothing. Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Let me tell you something. God knows what you can take. Because if you go over, his hand will catch you. Hallelujah. All right. Listen to this. And as he lay, he slept under a juniper tree. Behold, and an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. Let me tell you something, church, when you feel that low and that down, you take the cake, the bread of life, and you start reading it. Amen? 
And then you take the water, the cruise of water, and you start asking the Holy Spirit to lead you. Because by the word of God, by the leading of the Spirit, He'll give you strength again to get up from that resting place. He'll give you strength to get up and go on. Not just stay there and wallow in self pity but to get up and go. God did not raise you up from death to take you to death. He raised you up unto life. That's what the word says. Amen. Listen to this. And he looked and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water in his head. And he didn't eat and drink. Did the angel say, lay down? No. All the angel said was eat and drink. And get up. Oh, but the flesh is weak. Amen. The spirit was probably willing, but the flesh is weak. And he laid down again. How many are glad that God doesn't give up? And you know God doesn't give up because you just raised your hand. Amen. You know God doesn't give up because you can take that same hand and put it over your heart. It's still beating. Amen. Listen to this. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time. Oh, thank God he comes again and again. And he touched him and said, arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. Listen, this journey through life is too great for us. We cannot make it by good words alone. We can't make it by good preaching alone. We can't make it by good teaching alone. We can't make it by good friends and good family. We can only make it by what thus saith the word of God from his word and the leading of the Holy Spirit. If Elijah had arisen up, not taken the cake, not drank the water, he would have been just as bad off. He had to make that because the journey was too great. I don't know where your journey is going to lead. I don't know all that you've been through, but I know this. God can equip you for the journey. God has been with you in the past and he'll be with you in the future. I don't want you to give up because all through this, you'll notice that God is with him. God did not leave him. God was by his side and he never gave up on him. Never gave up on him. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise because he never gave up on you. He never gave up on me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he arose and did eat and drink. You're talking about a, a 500 mile round trip journey all out of the way and out of the will of God. Isn't it amazing when you start walking by fear instead of by faith how far you get from God. I'm afraid I won't have this. I'm afraid I won't feel like this. I'm afraid I won't get this. I'm afraid I'll never do that again. And fear pushes. Pushes. Because our relationship with God is a faith relationship. Either we have faith that God will provide or we don't. And one thing or the other is going to take place in our life. We're either going to have faith, which draws us near, or we're going to have fear, which pushes us away. Do you see, he's 500 miles round trip away from God. I feel like many times in my life I've been way more than that. <laughs> but I got good news. Listen to this. And he came thither unto a cave. And lodged there, his hiding place. Don't you know that God guided him and led him right there? And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? I can't tell you how many times me operating by fear has taken me out of the will of God. But I can tell you this, that every time God provided me a hiding place, and listen, even though I was going the opposite direction, I couldn't run too fast for God. <laughs> I couldn't get out of his sight. Listen, I couldn't get out of his heart. He loves me that much. And he found me in my cave. And he said, Jim, what are you doing here? <laughs> Thank God he said that. Because you know what? That's how God handled just about everybody in the Bible. Do you remember when Job was feeling so down for himself, so bad for himself? I wish that I had never passed through my mother's knees. Cursed be the hands that delivered me. Uh, cursed be the person who named me. I mean, he's cursing everybody. He's just tired. <laughs> Listen to this. 
God looks at Job and he doesn't say, well, this is why this is happening. He says, Job, what are you doing here? Here's how he said it to Job. He said, Job, where were you? Where were you when I was putting the stars in the sky? Where were you when I made the sun and the moon and I named these stars? Every one of them have a name, by the way. When you look at the stars, realize that God named each one of those. Isn't that awesome? Man can't even number them. And God named them. How? They are in a, listen, <laughs> They have no life. But God gave us life. And he thought to us, how much more, how much more does he love you and I? He loves me so much that he found me in my cave of despair and said, Jim, I'm not leaving you. Family may leave you. Friends may leave you. But I won't leave you. I even want to leave me. And God said, I'm not leaving you. I want to turn my back on me a lot of times and say, well, I'll be back. And God says, I love you more than you love yourself. Oh, give me praise. And just like a true child of God, Elijah starts making excuses. Can I get an amen? <laughs> he starts talking about all the good things he's done. Because the thing we do when God finds us, if we're not where we should be with him, is we start trying to justify what we're doing. <laughs> Elijah looks at God and he said, God, I fought for you. I've been jealous for you, God. In other words, God, look where I am. I'm in a cave. I fought for you. I stood up to 850 false prophets and the king and the queen, kind of. A little run, run in there, but whatever. Stood up to them. I've been jealous for you, God. You want to read his words? Watch this. He says, verse number 10. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, slain your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. The children of Israel, the last he heard of them, they said, let the Lord God be our God. There was only one person that had sent him a letter that said, you're going to die. So now he's exaggerating. How many of us are known? I'm sorry. This is the South. We don't call it exaggerating. We call it embellishing. Mm -hmm. I like to embellish just a little bit. The fish that I caught was not. That was the bait. The fish that I caught was this bit. Yeah. I'm not a very good fisherman. <laughs> and he said, go forth. God didn't even answer him about that. He's trying to justify himself to God, and God doesn't even give him a second to justify. You understand that no matter how much we say, no matter how convinced we... You ever heard the term reading your own press? The term, it, it, it's, it's like, um, say you own uh, an advertising agency, and you start advertising for yourself, and you make up a bunch of stuff about yourself, and then you start to believe the stuff you made up about yourself. That's believing your own press. Elijah started believing his own press. I am the only one. I'm the only one that stood up for God. Everybody's against me. God owes me. God just looks at him. God doesn't even say anything to him. You can imagine God maybe, maybe rolling his eyes a little bit. And he looks at him and says, look, go, <laughs> go forth and stand upon the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind, a wind. Now listen, we've had some pretty strong winds. For me and Selena live and out where she teaches in Camp Creek, it's always blowing out there. You know, most of the schools in Green County, they put up... Uh, Solar panels, like solar farms, to help with the cost of energy out there, they're like, no, we're putting up a windmill. <laughs> because of that. 
It's always going on. But I have never seen. I was in Mississippi during Hurricane Katrina. But I have never, ever seen a wind be able to rip a But this is what happened. Watch this. God passes by. God walks by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains. That's power. That's power. And broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. Whew. But the Lord was not in the wind. That's just what happened when he's around. I'm not in that wind. That's just, that's just how it chooses to praise me. <laughs> and after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. We so many times are listening to ourselves. I want to do this. I need to do this. God, why don't you do this? God, why don't you do that? I need to go there. You need to go here. And you need to do this. And you need to do that. And we're so busy talking that we don't stop and take time to listen. It would literally take a lot of times, for me included, an earthquake for me to shut up. The, the wind... There's always some in every crowd. Isn't there? The wind to break a mountain in half and to crush rocks. It would take that for me to get my attention back on what it should be. And that whole time, I wonder sometimes when I finally hear that still small voice, I wonder how long he's been. I wonder how many things he's been trying to tell me. That I've been too stubborn, too caught up, too, too sorry for myself. Too irritated, too aggravated to listen. To listen. See, we live in a society where we're constantly bombarded by music, by uh, by TV, by all kinds of input, uh, uh, video games, whatever else. It's always all kinds of input. You're in your house. You have a TV. No, no doubt. Probably have a CD player. There's video games around. Stuff is always going on. How many times cell phone, oh absolutely, cell phones and games on your cell phone, music on your cell phone, always something going on. And then we leave the house and we get into a car and we got the radio playing. And then we get out of the car and we walk into a store and they got music playing. And we walk out of the store going up to the next level in the elevator and they got elevator music playing. There's always something going on. You know, sometimes it's just good Get alone and be quiet and listen. So many times we're so caught up in looking for that great thing. Oh, God's gonna, He's gonna answer my prayer. I'm gonna, I'm gonna see it in a, on a billboard somewhere. Or, uh, uh, a meteor's gonna crash out of the sky. Or, or, or God's gonna part the cloud. He's gonna, there, he's gonna say something. You know what? God's talking all the time in a still small voice. So here's what he said. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? Now, I want you to understand what's going on here. Sometimes we can be so pig-headed that we can hear God's voice and still be stuck on ourselves. This is what happened with Elijah. You understand why I'm telling you that this is supposed to be an encouragement for us? Because God, all the way through this, never gave up on Elijah. God could have looked at Elijah and said, look, just your life is a miracle. He didn't do that. God could have looked at Elijah and said, look how I've used you miraculously to, to defy the laws of nature. He didn't do that. He said, look, you saw me pass by and the mountains rent and earthquakes and small. You heard me. But he didn't do that. God has more patience. And that patience is because of the love that he has for us. <laughs> That's amazing to me. I, I can't comprehend it. I can't understand it. But that patience is born out of the love that he has for us. 
How awesome is that? And, and we've gone for years, a lot of people, ignoring, going the other way. I don't want to go to church. I don't want anything to do with God. I want to think, and a lot of people aren't even that belligerent. It's just, I don't have time. I don't have time. You see, church, if they really realized how much God loved them, <laughs> if they really grasped that kind of love that doesn't let go, that kind of love that doesn't say goodbye, if they could really grasp that kind of love, you're talking about churches all over this world that would be packed out. New churches being built, expanded onto because people realize the love of God and they just want to know more about it. Amen? That's our job, though. We have felt that love. It's time for us to go out. This is what happens. Watch this. And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel forsaken your covenants, throw down your altars, and slain your prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life and take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go. Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you come, anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. Now, do you see what happened here? This is a tactic I, I use on the bus sometimes. I'll be able to relate to this probably. I'll sit here and I'll drive. And at that distance and through the mirror, they can't really see my eyes on them. They know I'm looking back there, but they see my eyes on them. I've handled it different ways in the past. And I see somebody throw something across the aisle. Grab the mic. Seat six. You know what you did. Come here. Yeah, what's up? Well, what did you throw? I didn't throw anything. You didn't throw anything? No, I didn't throw anything. Okay, go sit down. That's how I handled it the first year I drove. But here's how I handle it now. Seat six, come up here. Hey, what's up? Why did you throw that? See the difference? I gave them a chance to lie. You can't give them a chance to lie. You ask them why they did it. They're like, oh, well, I said, listen, I'm not, I've even had them lie after that. No, 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 I didn't throw it. I'm not asking you if you threw it. I already know that. I'm asking you why you did that. Did they do something to you? So you go, I got it. Yeah. They, they were talking about me. Oh, okay. Well, we'll take care of them too. Tell them come up here. You see what I'm saying? This is what God did. His mind was on himself. God had to get a mind off himself. What better way to get your mind off yourself than get a job? Oh, my. I did it. I said the J word. I've got... Members of the family. Oh, y'all pray now. Y'all pray. Just go ahead, stretch your hands this way. Just pray for a little bit. Yes, amen. I've got members of the family. Now, I'm saying it like that because you don't know if it's my family, my immediate family, my wife's family, our church family, maybe even the bride of Christ. I've got members of the family. That don't do anything but sit and think up things and then believe their own press. Okay, now get an amen. amen. Anybody know people like that? Go ahead. Stretch them high. Stretch them high. If you're sure. <laughs> All right. So here's the deal. God gives us a job. If we're busy about our job for God, we don't have time to make up stuff about other people. We don't have time to meddle in other people's affairs. we got time to get our mind on God and doing His work. You understand that this is exactly what God did. He didn't say, alright, uh, why are you here? What are you doing there? Why, why are you sitting there? Come on, talk to me. But he's like, listen, here's what I want you to do. Go anoint this person to be king. Go anoint him to be king. Now you've got a job. Now you've got something to preoccupy you. Go down to verse 18. God tells him, listen, you're emphatically wrong about all these things you've been saying. He says this, yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. You see what was going on there? He was showing him, hey, listen, I've heard you every time you said that, but I'm going to tell you the truth about what you've been saying. I've got 7,000 that have not even bowed to Baal. Let me tell you something, church. 
We may not have in our immediate family, our immediate friends, or even at work, 7,000 on our sides. But I'm going to tell you this. If there's enough between you and God, that's all you need. Just you and the Lord. You are a majority. Amen. With every head bowed and every eye closed.